I would like to introduce Ian and, and Ginny who will talk us through um, enabling self-management more than smart digital widgets. Over to you. Good afternoon. Welcome from a sunny Darlington, which has uh, got a little bit of background noise, I'm afraid. A little bit of traffic, but we should be okay. My name's Ian Briggs. Um, and I'm Jeannie Hardy. What we'd like to do is just take you through um, an approach we've taken on digital. Um, part of this has been through patient feedback and clinical input, and part of it's been through the fact that we were uh, one of the key or seven-day exemplar sites, and we had to do some things differently to actually get some things in place. So a lot of this design and sort of uh, our story is around, um, it's about multidisciplinary teams and things. So we've gone for problems and issues, not for initiatives looking for something to do. One of the early problems we found in the, it was that uh, we were in danger of having boxes or smartphones looking for people to attach themselves to, rather than actually solving problems, requirements, or opportunities. So I'll begin to walk through a story for you. I uh, hope it's got some interest. Part of this in, in a very first approach was that there was more than one element to what we were doing with the digital work that we were trying to enable. Um, clearly one of the key things would be meeting patient care or lifestyle and choices. That's a big issue rather than just the condition it's make, letting people make lifestyle choices because that tends to motivate them and Jeannie will pick that up. Dealing with increased demand and a 24-7 access. Uh, one of the things we were sort of concerned about in the early days was if we started doing more work with seven-day working in care homes and with people in their own home, if they were using digital self-management uh, approaches, how could we get it back into the uh, teams that were supporting them? So we had a bit of work to do around uh, finding an approach that would do that so the clinical record could be updated. We also very importantly wanted to offer clinicians and service managers options to save time and improve quality. Because we recognize that short of skills, short of people to recruit into the system, what could we actually do to actually improve efficiency? We also know that our clinicians have got great uh, service know-how, and we wanted to make sure we could make the best use of improving the way we did pathways and care planning. Importantly, we didn't really want to get into a discussion about uh, laying digital on top of existing pathways to give busy people more to do. We wanted to find a way of actually being more creative. And we recognize as well as part of this that if we've got the know-how and the service skills, we might not have the uh, infrastructure and the, uh, as I call it from a partner uh, point of view, we don't know how to do the plumbing to get the information from the patient and the service user back into the uh, records and into the system. So we recognized we had to do beyond what was our normal way of working. We also recognize that uh, going forward, a vision for digital health would be, and we began to think, at some point with self-management and, uh, and choice, there would be a national community of apps sponsored by clinicians and care professionals. People could go on NHS Choices potentially and click on a self-management option. We needed to build modules that linked apps to service areas so that it was about supporting the service, not the technology. Again, this effective use of clinical uh, and care service time, improving triaging and outpatient appointments would be quite important for everyone. Integrating with urgent care, if we got this right, we could have the system beginning to flag people at risk or people on systems with urgent care, so we didn't have to have the A&E as the only option moving forward. We recognize as well sharing, spreading content and best practice. We needed to get alongside other people who were doing well and actually learn from it. The agnostic technology platform is a technology babble buzzwords in some ways, but what it actually meant was because things were changing so fast, and things are changing so fast, whatever we began to build and develop had to recognize that technology would change in the next five years. So whatever we did had not to be system specific or one particular provider specific. We had to allow ourselves some flexibility to move forward. And we also crucially recognized that there'd be some uh, key cultural changes. And we put down here the patient care or lifestyle choices that people want to make, because we were already getting then people wanting to choose lifestyle options about when they receive support and treatment. I'll come back to later on where there's a big cultural shift in the clinical side of things, and Jeannie will pick that up. Lessons learned from previous uh, digital health projects, because we've done them as well, and we put lots of boxes in at one point, and actually didn't get much uptake. Uh, we recognized from our point of view, and this is our story, that uh, 
it must always be NHS, local authority designed. What Black really is trying to say is allow the NHS and their care partners some flexibility to fit the digital support around local problems, requirements or opportunities. But the big point there is don't do digital for digital sake in terms of moving it forward. Uh, organization support and commitment essential. Uh, recognition there, digital is about cultural shifts, We're both in those delivering and those receiving care. Uh, that's one of the biggest steps, things we've found. It has to integrate with clinical systems where possible, particularly on some of the 24-7 and 7-day work, working approaches. What we need to be able to do is make sure using NHS number tag, we could get some of this information for monitoring information or alert information back into multidisciplinary teams. So the NHS number tag was important and our view was in the future, standalone bespoke systems would not be sustainable in terms of moving forward. So the bridge, the digital divide, this is the key one about the patients and the service users and those wanting to use it. It's really important that we, if we're ever going to get self-management to work properly, we would allow access and we start empowering people. So it's about offering access and choice to improve better lifestyle. It's also to improve people making choices about how their care would like to be delivered. And if we get it right, that they wouldn't actually be stuck in one place to get that care from. So if they wanted to move around with their lifestyle, they could. Keep it simple and minimize the cost. Uh, we recognize in the middle of this lots of widgets and things out there to do things. Part of this will be recognizing that we do have people in the system who are carrying around some equipment with them as well. So where possible, if we're going to do monitoring in particular, we would actually use monitoring the equipment that was available, but leave the flexibility to do what we needed to do. Also, we also recognize that not everybody has mobile phones. Not everybody has internet access. In fact, we've come back to a story later on where the landline, in some cases, parts of the, the Durham Dales area, have no broadband, have no text. So it was important that we allowed some choice and some flexibility. Uh, governance can't be compromised. We spent a lot of time with the information governance and the clinical governance to make sure it's right. And absolutely crucial is to evaluate from the start, measure, measure, measure where we could. Because inside that was getting significant cohorts above 30 to actually get the real information back from. And crucially, beginning to get feedback and alter systems where, where appropriate. We began to develop something, and this, uh, this is a, a diagram that we'll build. Health Call became a brand that we put in place, and we recognized that inside this approach, we had the clinical know-how and the nows to do some stuff. We needed a partner, and as an NHS provider, and it's an NHS-driven system with our partners, we decided to build up something, this agnostic platform, and we found somebody who could work with us, and we began to build this platform with some key components in it. We recognized that we needed to have various ways of inputting into our system whether it was the, the devices, traditional devices that have been used in the past, telecare, telehealth, the standalone uh, landline, the mobile phone, the internet access, or the SIM-enabled uh, pieces to, to make things work that are building, built into uh, equipment nowadays. We also recognize that lots of people would want to see the output. Urgent care, where we could actually have people monitoring, being picked up by Urgent Care 111, rather than uh, coming into A&E when ambulance can be picked up and actually dealt with in a slightly different way, different service. The hospital might need to look at it, the GP, the pharmacy, and the community. We started to work with a company called In Healthcare, who was a, a, a partner, technology partner. Quite importantly, they host NHS records, and they actually are inside an N3 environment, which gives us the security to allow us to move things forward in a secure way, and the NHS number can be used inside this environment. So we began to put things together in such a way that we could then allow online access for patients and service users inside this framework. We could allow decision-making software where appropriate, where the information could come in, access decision-making software. So INR is, the, is an example there where we've got anticoagulant treatment, so the information can be used by clinicians and fed back into the system. Crucially, it would actually allow stuff to go back into TPP or EMIS web for us, or the GP record system. This was where we could make sure that other people supporting particular long-term conditions uh, uh, sufferers could actually have their information being updated to the latest information, and actually monitoring and trending and alerts and better care planning could then be put in place. So that was our system. We worked with our partner in healthcare to, to put that together. That's their expertise, and they don't mind me saying too much, they were the plumbers that so actually allowed us to link all those things together. So we began to build some systems around need where we had them. 
And the sort of things we've put on the system already have been uh, for stroke prevention, AF screening, INR testing, water and self-management, some vital signs monitoring, a digital stethoscope we've got which actually transmits signals in real time so a clinician can actually send heart or respiratory sound back to, a, to a, another point so a nurse could do it back to a, a GP or to a consultant in a hospital. Some clinical triage with integration with 111. Care home support, we've got nutrition assessment, uh, diabetes monitoring, falls monitoring, uh, some now some point of care testing we're working on. Some behavioral change support. Again, these are systems where we've identified a key thing about volume. These are systems we put in, not for small numbers, where we think the biggest advantage for us was to go for services and pathways with volume involved, lots of people. And even now to the uh, chronic pain and depression. And the chronic pain system, for example, there is an app that can actually run now that um, allows people to manage their pain and the GP can prescribe it from his desktop uh, system one, for example, and put a token so people can join and then log their uh, performance and their, uh, their progress. And then when they have a conversation with a clinician, it's about not how are you, it's about what's happened and how things are moving forward. So we've built a system up. Take an example now as a proof of concept for how we'd make all this work. One of the first ones you looked at was uh, INR, anticoagulant monitoring. This came from uh, the fact that there was, there was a concern how could we actually meet the demand of housebound patients and how could we meet the demand of the clinics. Also, we began to see patients coming forward saying that they didn't like traveling in and what a disruption to their life it was and their lifestyle. So we began to work up a proof of concept where we would allow patients with a coagu check meter from Roche to actually begin to test themselves at home. And the way it would work is we would arrange for people to be trained and supported, and Jeannie will cover that. But they would then have an agreed time when they would be, uh, would be rung. They would have done their testing. The patient gets an automated call, answers some questions to make sure that uh, there's no sort of clinical issues to, to be dealt with. They'd enter their information. The results would go back to a, uh, to a central point across our plumbing system. This would then allow somebody to dose the uh, INR anticoagulant change based on the readings that's come in and would then send the information back and then the, the patient would pick it up or service user would pick it up uh, from a booked phone call and then would go around the cycle again in terms of how that worked. Now lots of checks and things are put in place inside this on some of the key issues about it will ring you back if you're not available. It will do some checks if there's anything drifting on measurements a nurse will ring you back in terms of how things work. So this was a system we began to build. Ironically, we, we were then asked by a lot of the users to move it back to landline because that was their preferred choice in terms of how this worked. So we began to run a system, but this system can work equally on landline, text, um, internet, app, moving things forward. So that was the proof of concept. What were the findings from allowing people to self-manage on this process? About 2,500 warfarin sufferers in County Durham and Darlington, uh, normal service delivery from outpatients, satellite clinics, home visits, and telehealth we began to bring in. Service by anticoagulation nurses, district nurses, healthcare assistants, pathologists, so quite a, a big economy of different ways of dealing with it. But we're going to allow people choice was one of the key issues here, so people can choose to self-manage. Two cohorts of patients uh, chosen. First cohort was, uh, was 100. These were quite carefully uh, selected in terms of uh, the people running the, the trial for the first cohort, but the age range was actually quite broad. And I think the oldest person that we've ever had in the system is about 93 in terms of how it works. But the system was then allowed to run for cohorts in terms of giving you, so it is for everyone to move it forward. We then uh, ran a second cohort, and I'll come back to that, where people responded to an adverts really, and they were, came into the system and were trained how to use it. Again, a good age range of people often get told that uh, some older people won't use the system, but that's uh, not what we found. So good range of people. Um, patient feedback was almost universally positive because people began to manage their own condition and, and their lifestyle, began to do the testing when it suited them. And we'll give you some examples later of uh, particular cases where people transformed their lifestyle in terms of becoming more self-managing. And actually, as we come on to in a little while, the results actually began to improve the clinical results as well. Staff as well, because it's one of the key bits of the equation we've learned through all this is it's not just the patient and the service user and their lifestyle changes and culture, 
we're actually going to have to move a whole health economy in some cases where there is, uh, in some cases, uh, an unwillingness to let people self-manage, um, not for the wrong reasons, but it's the way that some of the training, even some of the clinicians we've worked with said it was found it hard to allow people to self-manage and, and let go. But Jeannie will talk a little bit about some of our learning on that. Some of the key numbers that came out of the back of the, uh, of the results, and this is almost two years ago, over two years ago now when we started it. For the first uh, 100 cohorts, a uh, narrow uh, group of people picked out. Um, the time in therapeutic range, TTR, was, it was actually um, 60.4 before the test, and it moved up to 72, 74%. Quite an important uh, step change. So here are people self-testing themselves and improving their time in therapeutic range which then re consequently reduces their risk of stroke. So that was the narrow hand pick. The second cohort of people were actually who mostly recruited lads. And again, a similar change in, um, in time and therapeutic range actually identified in terms of how that, uh, how that cohort worked. So what we were finding was that uh, the act of people self-managing was actually improving both the outcome and the lifestyle. And again, for 200 patients in total, uh, come back later, but one of the key learning points from as well, because the way we train people and, they, and encourage them around their lifestyle goals, actually we've managed to have over 90% sort of retention rate after two to three years, and the results are still as good in terms of TTR. The debate gets interesting in terms of what does it cost and all the new drugs coming out, the NOACs and everything moving forward. One of the key things we went out to look at, and it was a genuine trial as to what the different ways of actually receiving anticoagulation treatment and support are, outpatient, satellite, self-testing, home care, and the new NOACs coming through. And we began to think about the whole system issues here because one of the things you do when you're evaluating is uh, on the financial side, all the good things for people about uh, their experience, how they like it. On the money side, there's very short-termism in some areas, and there's some bigger things to take into account when you actually look at how cost-effective things are. On the surface, we struggled in some ways. We matched roughly what outpatient, just slightly more expensive in terms of the short-term clinic stuff. When you begin to look at the issues for the whole health economy around strokes and consumables and anticoagulant prescribing, the whole system benefit is actually quite different when you look at the pricing in terms of where self-testing comes in. So it's quite an important step and we found in evaluation is the short-termism and then the whole system changes. We do an evaluation, we're getting more work done on the evaluation in terms of moving forward. Key questions for us then, to look at was um, this lifestyle thing, this lifestyle and outcome. When you start talking to people about uh, motivation to stay on some of the self-management systems, this actual approach reduced elective trips to clinic from an average of 18 per year down to one. It saves people uh, average 60 pound per year on travel and parking costs are actually uh, <laughs> working in an acute hospital are not cheap if you can get parked. Patients can now review the warfarin anywhere in the world, their dosage. This is really, really interesting one. We've got several people now who go on holiday and are allowed to go on holiday because they can keep themselves inside the dose. One of the problems you get with, uh, with anticoagulant treatment is it can move with food and environment, so the need to keep yourself right when you're on holiday. The time in therapeutic range has improved by an average of 17% over a period of two years, reducing the risk of uh, thrombotic events. It actually provides an opportunity for people to continue taking warfarin without the need to take time off work or visit the clinic. Several patients said to us it takes a lot out of their life and having to take time off to get to visit the clinic, where this actually allows them to manage their condition in the way they want to be managed. It's a great uh, opportunity for the NHS. This became a nice exemplar product in terms of uh, nice put out guidance that should be supporting, CCD should be supporting people on self-management of uh, anticoagulation. And this became one of the exemplar products and services to do that. Cost around 16 pence per day. Uh, the big cost reduction worry about the, uh, the NOACs would be if you put everybody on that, the, the overall cost of the NHS going forward was quite big, 770 million. And some of the stats we did with the uh, health economists was if we achieved 16% in Warfarin uh, patients at a national level, this would equate to 1,500 patients per year reduction in stroke. It also helps in the uh, five-year forward view, which we're driving on in terms of making self-care happen. So we also had a long discussion with our other partners, Roche, and uh, we moved away from a buying the equipment into a leasing approach, which was far better for us in terms of the economics and the in moving things forward. So we actually managed, 
to influence some national strategy on that. It gives clinicians reassurance uh, designed and by operational NHS nurses ensuring safety was at the centre of what they did. Provides a digital audit trail of every interaction with the system. We've used uh, not advertising for us, Dawn, but INF Star is a similar system, but it keeps a complete record. By allowing 300 patients to self-test, the patients who remained in the clinic have more time with the clinicians, which has improved their TTR, which we've found a 3% increase. Health call is connected directly to GP records, so the information goes back into System 1 or EMIS in our case in the Northeast, so there's real-time updates. And if analysis is beginning to become more, we well, can see it in A&E as, uh, as the multidisciplinary teams move in. Internally, it reduced the processing time for each dosing event by 85%. I would like to stop there and hand over to my uh, my training and support <laughs> expert, Jean. Hello, everybody. Um, I don't speak quite as loud as Ian, but I'll try and uh, speak up so I can get uh, so you can hear me. Um, my role throughout the project. So I'm going to talk about the um, INR project uh, specific um, and what what we found from that. Um, so my role started as project manager, but I've got a clinical background as well, nursing background. And so I got very involved also um, in the training element um, in the first instance, but then continued with that because I found that there was so much learning um, from that direct contact with clinicians and patients, which then fed into the learning around the overall project uh, and moving forward and the success of that. And so um, I'd like to start with some patient stories um, because they're always very powerful too, um, so you can hear actually the impact for the patients. Um, so real patients, real lives. We've got four particular cases here. Um, I'll start with the first one, Mr. A, and this was a gentleman who was one of the first patients we trained. And really interesting because he, he works up in Scotland on the oil rigs. Um, and he told us the impact, um, certainly of the, um, the ability to self-test for him was that he didn't need a, a, around a 300 mile round trip to come back to his local clinic because that was where he preferred to have his testing done. Um, he didn't need to make that trip each time and so um, that was a massive impact benefit for him um, in that, you know, obviously time, travel, away from work, having to, you know, work his work around um, clinic was a, a, a huge benefit for him. The next lady, um, she travels around the world quite a lot. Um, um, I have to say, she did misplace her quaggy check machine at one point, having uh, flown somewhere, so we had to replace it. But she um, is another lady, a great advocate. She was trained very early on, and the massive impact for her work lifestyle um, certainly wouldn't, uh, she wouldn't be able to get back for clinic. She would end up um, not attending clinic because she was away with work. And so the benefit is that wherever she's working, she can do her self-testing uh, and she can link with her local clinic. The third gentleman, Mr. C, he um, lives, we, we have a, a, both a rural and urban um, community around us in um, Durhamdale, Darlington. And this gentleman lives out in Weardale and ha he, he actually works still, but um, the impact in the winter time can be that, you know, roads are very bad for traveling um, and so, you know, it can be risky actually getting down to the local hospital to the clinic, um, but he doesn't have to do that. He can self-test and uh, where he is and there's a, there is a real benefit for our rural patients um, with this work. The last lady, Mrs. Dover, um, she's been a, a great advocate for the service since we started. Um, I'd just like to give you a little bit more um, on the background and, and the impact for her um, because it, it's, um, you know, it's quite heartwarming really to know the impact of um, being able to self-test that has had on her lifestyle. So Kay, um, very intelligent lady, 51 years old when she started um, on Warfarin. Um, worked in the local university, a background in public health lecturing. She developed a condition and she, she's quite open, um, we've shared a story with many times, and she had a, a condition called lupus, uh, which she calls um, results in sticky blood. So she had two deep vein thromboses as a result of that. She described it as devastating um, on her personally, and certainly her self-confidence was low when she started on warfarin, given the things that had happened. Um, and so regular monitoring, she had to come to the clinic most weeks, um, and she 
said the impact of that was her time away from her students um, and also she felt really guilty about having to come to clinic. She talked about warfarin and the dislike because of the restrictions it had on her lifestyle um, and she was actually one of the first patients that we trained but keen also that she was, she was a little bit anxious that she didn't lose the contact with the, uh, with the staff in the clinic because they made her feel safe. Um, but the other impact that it had that soon after she started self-testing, she was able to spend time with her, with her mom and her sister who actually um, were terminal and, and died and she was able to self-test while she was caring for them. And so for her, the impact you know, was, was really massive. For me, um, being involved with um, INR self-testing and, and looking at, well, what have we learned from this work? For me, understanding the patient um, is really, really important and if you can't engage the patient, um, then obviously it doesn't work. And the, and the areas, um, particularly I've got a framework that I use, but um, the environment is really important to consider when any, any patient is going to self-test. You've got to look at both the patient and who else is around them, both from their family, uh, their workplace, colleagues, um, even down to their GPs and what they're telling them. Everything has an impact um, on the patient. Um, their lifestyle, uh, can we move on to the next slide? I'll just move you on to the next, the next slide so you can, um, okay, so within the environment, knowing the patient population, so what is their current service? How did they get that service? So some of them are coming to clinic. Um, some of them might have um, home visits. Um, some go to satellite clinics. So understanding both what they get currently and then what their lifestyle is, I think is key to being able to move them forward into self-testing. Um, and where some people, um, if they live next door to the clinic, very close to the clinic, there isn't always the benefit to self-testing. Um, but for others, um, depending on if they're working or if they travel or if they're retired and spend a lot of time away, then these are the patients who really do uh, benefit. But also those patients who maybe have the capability, they are at home, they may have disabilities, but they can self-test. So they can still be quite independent in that way. Um, just uh, the next point is around personal concerns and issues and this goes both for um, patients and also clinical staff because we have to understand when somebody comes along for training what are their concerns and issues um, and a lady we were involved with training last week came along and she was, saying she was concerned really about warfarin itself and so sometimes you're having conversations with them about what's going on for them before you can actually move them on to self-managing, self-testing understanding their lifestyle goals, so what will be the biggest impact for them, what will be the benefit if they go, um, then move on to self-testing. The context of their life and their work, whether they're retired, whether they're working, it's really important to understand how this is going to impact on them and those around them. Um, so the next slide is around um, patients' behaviour and capability. Um, and it, it feeds on from the previous slide. Where do they currently receive their care? But how do they interface with the clinical system, the, the clinicians, the nurses? How often do they need to go to clinic? Some are weekly, some are monthly, some are a little less often than that. Um, and so patients in the early days told us, well, actually, we like coming, some like to come to clinic. Others don't like to come to clinic at all. So if you've got somebody who prefers actually to see somebody face to face, uh, then they're much less likely to take up um, self-testing. But the majority of the patients, um, particularly with this, uh, whatever condition they've got that requires warfarin, um, they don't want to be seen as having an illness or a disease as such. They want to be seen as um, well. And so often being away from a, a clinical system, um, they, they feel is really good. Um, but we need to also um, assess both the competence and the capability of our patients who are coming along for training. They need to be able to, if they're using the phone system, be able to hear the call, be able to use um, input into the um, telephone keypad or whichever system they're using. Or else if they can't do that, they need a carer or a family member who can support them in doing that. Um, we try to keep it as flexible as we can so that we can support whoever wants to manage in this way. Um, so we, we work in partnership um, and each individual when they come to be trained will know um, what they need, how much training they need. 
usually we have two sessions. We have a group session first, and then we have a follow-on one-to-one -one session if we're doing training. Occasionally, people may need more support than that, and that may come from um, the training, or it might come from the clinicians once they've started with the actual um, service, um, once being trained and signed off. But we also need to know, are they motivated, and are they organized? And this I learned very early on in the training. We had one gentleman who was very capable, who could do it, who was working still. But he wasn't very structured. He wasn't organized. And he just said, no, no, this isn't for me. It would have required too much effort on his part to actually be organized enough to do it. So he preferred to come to clinic where somebody can just test his blood and tell him what to take <laughs> from, from a warfarin point of view. So moving on, beliefs and values. Um, these drive our behaviors, and so we need to understand somebody's, um, what they believe about what they're doing, what do they believe about self-management. Um, culturally, we know that um, older people sometimes have been um, within a system where they're used to um, clinicians, doctors telling them what to do, and some don't want to take on that, that role of self-managing. And so we have to sometimes coach them through that actually, if they really want to do this, um, if they are, it, is, it is possible. Um, but we need to understand, again, around their capability, their competence. But also part of what we do is around um, just supporting them. And if they really want to self-manage, then we can, we can help them to do that. But again, there has to be some benefit to the individual. Moving on, um, we've got a little bit of a typo there. It should be clinical behaviors. Um, but we thinking about leadership and how we move somebody from one place to another. So when we started with um, the, the INR project particularly, um, we had one, certain behaviors that, you know, how people, um, certainly clinicians in the clinic, who would be directing patients, um, telling them to come into clinic, this is what to do, this is what to take. Um, and often very little time um, to spend because there were so many patients coming through clinic. And so part of the work, we had to work alongside the clinicians. Um, and if we move through the, um, to the coaching element, so coaching both the clinicians around letting go, um, enabling the patients to actually take some control themselves, but also, you know, supporting them, that's okay, but we learned as we went along and, um, and gathered all of that learning to, to actually um, put it back into the project. Um, on this as well, you, sometimes patients um, may um, move through from being attending clinic, but then to self-managing, self-testing. But sometimes things happen and they may need to come back into the clinic for a little while if, you know, they've had something else going on. Um, they might need a little bit more support. We've had people who, you know, might be other things going on in their lifestyle that requires more support. So we've got a movement through, um, but it comes back to that patient assessment. What does the patient need at that time? Um, and so we've got to have some flexibility in, in that. Um, Moving on, consolidation of change. So when we've um, been successful, we've trained the patients, um, we've moved along. For me, there's a, there's a period of consolidation of change in any project, um, and that requires support to the patients. So when they first start with self-testing, um, we actually um, have them self-test on a weekly basis so they get used to the system, they get used to how they can actually um, test their blood, but also use the, the technology. Um, but also supporting the clinicians. So my role has been very supportive with the clinicians who've um, introduced the project, picking up issues as we go along and things that we thought we'd put in place may need slightly moving or changing as people find new things out. There's, a, there's an ongoing learning process there. Um, I mentioned flexibility earlier, but I think it's key that we, we flexible, but we keep listening to what, what's required for individuals, both patients and clinicians, and where they do need the support in the project. Um, it's got to be there for them. We had a very structured approach for the delivery um, of the project, and, and that was really, really useful. I think often clinicians don't have um, enough time in their day-to-day -day when they're implementing changes. So I think one of the big benefits of our project was we have dedicated time um, to support them around the policies, procedures, but just listening to their concerns um, and, and feeding back the learning into the overall project. 
Okay, I'll pass you back to Ian now just to pick up on the next slide. I think just we've given an example with INR, there are other ways, because the system is flexible, you can take input in different ways, you can build different pathways into it, but the information sharing it brings as well, we've just, to finish, we've put data sharing agreements in now between ourselves and third sector and local authorities, so the MDTs that run can begin to see the data. Uh, NHS number tag has been used to track people through systems to make sure when we're putting new pathways in that we can monitor people through. We've got uh, data sharing agreements with nationally where we can begin to do that for planning as well as care. And that allows better predictive modeling and commissioning because we begin to see the input from the self-management piece in terms of moving it forward. So we've done a package. We've focused on INR, but that isn't the only thing. The platform is the key and it's agnostic. The clinicians are then the real and the patients are the people who move that forward in different ways of different pathways, but it's about how you improve things. It's not forcing the technology in, is what we found. Um, I think we'll stop there. There's some slides at the end about, uh, we did a virtual reality walk around what it would look like with different long-term conditions and different approaches in, but I think we'll stop there. Brilliant, thank you very much. Just uh, have, have a little uh, breather for a second, and I'll, I'll just do a little bit of summing up and a little bit of um, sharing what's been coming through on Twitter, if that's okay. Um, and then we'll come back to you with some questions that we've got in the um, chat box. So, so what's coming through on Twitter is, um, and, and some of the questions will we'll give you an opportunity to feed back on this, um, is individuals need to be enabled to be self-reliant um, and independent, and this will include their quality of life and life chances, which I think fits um, perfectly with what you've been saying. Using digital media to create innovative pathways to meet patient and carer lifestyle choices. And um, Katie, who we work with very closely, um, who is a, a patient by experience, um, says that sounds intriguing to her as a patient. So those are the kinds of things that um, you know stimulate it. Um, another one is don't do digital for digital sake. Um, it has to make sense to the patient, the clinician, and the NHS, which I think is a, a fair point. Um, always good not to reinvent the wheel. So, you know, again, today is about learning from you. You've been through quite a journey. Um, you've uh, shared with us the good and, and what perhaps wasn't quite so good, and it helped us to learn from that, and that's really important. Um, another one along that theme of, you know, it being right for the individual of um, do all patients want to self-manage? Um, sometimes maybe they don't have the confidence to do this and other times they do. And that can be from an empowered and educated patient as well. So there's something around the individual but also the cycles of the longer term conditions um, and how they may act, particularly if they've got multiple long term conditions or uh, you know, having different impacts at different times. Um, some emails being shared, sorry, tweets being shared around lessons learned, so people very interested in your slides, Ian, um, and sharing those in real time. Um, the need for health coaching uh, to have empowerment to, um, to have the empowerment to effectively self-manage. So we did a WebEx about a week and a half ago now on, on um, health coaching, and, and what's coming through is that it seems to be those two component parts. It, you know, as well as other things, need to work hand in hand. And Katie's um, done a lovely tweet about, you know, the ducks seem to be getting in a row when we now need them all to start swimming in the same direction. I thought that was a lovely, um, a lovely kind of analogy to, to think through. There are a couple of re reflections from from me. Um, we've just done some ethnography work um, and one of them was around what we call the double care burden and it was the impact of the burden of healthcare needs on the family, you know, having to take a day off annual leave, to take somebody to an appointment which may or may not get cancelled, the parking which you raised, you know, all of those things have an impact. So it seems to me telehealth digital ways of working can help with some of those and the consequence of, of that and it's trying to get the right balance between independence and isolation is making sure that they still you know have those contacts um, with people um, and, and the quote uh, Julie I 
like from you is um, what, what does the patient need at that time? Because it's not just a one-off assessment, it's a continual understanding of where people are in their health journey, really. So, so those were my thoughts and reflections. I don't know if you to um, comment back while we just align all of the questions for you. I mean, one of the one of the key things that uh, that we found in all of this is uh, it is about that lifestyle and that patient focus. One of the things we also looked at is it needs to be part of a pathway or a, or a care plan. It's it's an offer, and you're right; it's situational, and people change. But we are looking now at um, working some care homes, yeah. care home staff to support people. We're also looking at um, a variation on luncheon clubs where people can come together for the isolation nutrition as well as to talk about their conditions and, and uh, if necessary have some uh, point of care testing done. So it is about trying to change people's lifestyle and the motivation you see from people, they're staying with it, you know, in terms of how it works because the, the training and the, and the support is yeah. slightly different. It's not here is the widget, how do you use it? It's almost this is the lifestyle goal, how do we help you get there? And you're right, Jeannie's point is well made about it's situational, why we sort of stall the situational leadership thing was, it changes. And you've got to keep looking back and make sure everybody's okay. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Right, let, let's open it up. If just wanted to start with Amrit, if we, if we can. Could we unmute Amrit, Sandra? Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, we can, Hi. yeah. Thank you for that, that was really yes, interesting. Yes, perfectly. I'm, yeah. I, I'm interested in finding out about the um, ins and outs of how you, 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 what systems you use. But actually, my question on the chat room was um, whether uh, I know that with the, your second cohort, um, you asked people to volunteer themselves, so your selection criteria is much broader. Did you? find that you had many people who, so a lot of people with long-term conditions they are a bit older might have some impact on their brain and I'm a psychiatrist so I have people who've got long-term con physical conditions but also have mm -hmm. schizophrenia for example. And I was just wondering if you yeah. worked with that cohort who you might yeah. conceivably think of as right at the top of the pyramid. Um, well. Right at the top of the pyramid, I'm not sure. I can, I can give you an example of a gentleman who um, I think was um, had some mental health problems, um, and the staff were very aware of um, of things going a, a little bit amiss with him. Um, and he was, was thought he was homeless at one point, um, so he'd been self-managing, self-testing, and then they brought him back into the clinic for a while. And then when things settled down again, he, he picked up the self-testing. So I think the brilliant thing about our service is the clinicians who were still very central to it. And regardless of the patient self-testing being at a distance, the staff still are, are quite aware of what's going on with individuals, and I think that's really important. Um, that people aren't left, you know, out out on a limb, even if they're self-testing, they've still got that contact if they need it. Um, but but cognitively, we usually um, obviously think about that when people want to self-test. We won't um, tell them they can't do it, but we obviously need to be very careful to make sure that they can manage. And so the training we use, um, we train them and we're assessing them while we're training them, and then we sign them off. But there's also a monitoring even after that. Um, an example, at tomorrow I'm going out to see a gentleman at home who's a little bit elderly but seems to be having a few difficulties that they've picked up, so we'll recheck if that if, if something is needed as well. So I would say it's an ongoing um, monitoring um, as we go along. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. Brilliant. So I, I just want to bring Nicola in. So uh, my, my background, um, other than transplant coordination, was in, in renal dialysis. So um, Nicola's got a question around the, the change. Well, uh, just shout Nicola when you're in, but the change between pre-dialysis, you know, where, where you're probably more empowered to 
becoming on dialysis and how that affects your motivation to want to continue self-managing. So, could I pick up on something? Yes. Um, when we when we first started with um, well, we overarchingly call it telehealth. We we have had um, people who have had renal problems who um, were um, doing a wait at home and um, monitoring themselves through the community matron as well, so that um, when things changed re with regard to their uh, fluid and their weight, um, then they could trigger them that they may need then more input. Um, so we had a couple of people who um, used that a little while ago. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that we've got anybody monitored at the moment, but it certainly meant that people could, um, when things changed with them, very quickly be triaged and if they needed to go into hospital for any particular treatment, um, then that could be enabled much easier and, and, and more planned um, in patient care rather than a, you know come to a, an emergency and need to go in very quickly. Um, so that was really successful um, at one particular patient. I think of in that regard. Ian, do you want to add anything? I mean, I think in the end, we are but scratching the surface of this, and and, and people, as we go forward, will will make this work for themselves, clinicians, and for and patients. And mm. I think it's important. Our limitations are make sure things are safe and make sure things are secure yeah. in terms of looking after people. But it's quite surprising what people can do if mm. you actually give them the chance. You've got to, and I think the situation is important. Yeah. Pick people up where they are yeah. and let them move on, but then just check after, you know, that's coming back. Mm -hmm. Systems that don't uh, don't have that sort of uh, overarching sort of system in place uh, uh, at this stage are worrying, but I think things will move on. More conditions will come on. We've had lots of other sort of uh, things we're developing in the background that um, use this sort of approach. But I think one of the keys is that we always have a link back into the clinicians. So regardless of people self-managing, self-testing, there's a link back into the clinicians and the clinical system that people are then picked up. Um, that you know, if, if something changes with them, they're monitored and they can be then uh, more quickly picked up with regards to their long-term condition and something done uh, sooner than later, rather than leave things until you know people are much worse. Yeah, we did um, a WebEx some months back now around self-management um, and some of their experience was that it was taking five years from diagnosis of a long-term condition to getting actually some help and support with self-management, yeah. by which time you've yeah. probably taken away all of their self-management yeah. yeah. in you know, yeah. skills and you know, ways of working, really. Well, that's it. I think it's important to get in there when, like you say, before they are really complex, that they, they get used to self-management managing and then um, it, it can change them, need more input, they need less input, you can you can tailor that to the patient's need. It's really important, I think, that they get the confidence to be able to self-manage um, earlier on because if we wait until they're too complex, then, it, you know, it, it doesn't work as well, definitely. And we're doing a fair bit of work around predictive work and modelling as well in terms of predeterminants of, of things and communication so people can begin mm -hmm. to uh, see what's available. Mm -hmm. and. One of the key things around people higher up the triangle is that when you've got uh, the multidisciplinary teams running, then uh, they'll know who's at high risk and who isn't, but they mm. can begin to monitor and, and help. Mm. You're right, picking people and helping them get into the system early is really important. That's why the access and choice piece is so important. Mm. Different people like to communicate in different ways, phone, text, web. You try to open the access as yeah. much as you can. You, you, you try to make it a choice. Mm. And, and that yeah. self-management is easier. How do I, is that bridging the digital divide, mm. as we call it, yeah. how do I open it up so people can do it? My daughter would tell me Facebook is old-fashioned now, <laughs> um, yet still across, you know, the system. Most, most, most uh, NHS trust will block it as a, a means of communicating. So. Yeah. You know, we, we need to add, add in on to your list in, I would say, you know, it's the, the agility of keeping up with social media yes. and different tools yeah. and techniques that's, um, you know, is equally as important, not just think we've got initiatives and new ways of working and that's it for the next 10 years. Why, why, we, so built really. this, why we work within healthcare for the agnostic platform was we looked at lots of other things that was really important that we recognised flexibility was important and things will change and people like have choice, so how do you yeah. get this to work in such a way that you're a little bit of future-proofing in so that as things change you can begin to move mm. with it? It's the data and the engagement is the important thing. 
Yeah, I agree. So, so just before we call this for an end, because we're a couple of minutes over, but just before we call this for an end, there's been an interesting chat in the chat box, which I doubt either of you have had a chance to have a look at, but we'll, we'll copy it and send it to you. But around end of life care um, as well, and I just wondered with your cohorts that you've been working with, have you had any experiences around end of life care? Um, we haven't specifically focused on end of life care at the moment. Not not with the projects we've done. Um, we've had we had some discussions early on about how we could do that, but that hasn't been one of our main main areas. But certainly something we'd like to um, take forward really in the future. One piece of work we have looked at, and it is uh, being developed, yeah. is the ability to for this data sharing. Because once you've got systems up, because the end of life care often has lots yeah. of people involved. And if you get that right, you can actually get the right yeah. data to the right people at the right time. And that's crucially important. I mean, some of the things we're doing with our local mm -hmm. ambulance service mm -hmm. is to allow them to see some of the data. And for, from the multidisciplinary teams that run, uh, they know who's got health care plans uh, and escalation plans. So paramedics can make decisions with yeah. me rather than A&E. So, yes, we're doing some work and have done some work around the basics of uh, end-of-life planning, but that's a real big data sharing exercise. Mm -hmm. But now we've got the protocols beginning to develop and the NHS number tags we can use in, in controlled ways, I think we've got a good chance to do some good work on that. Yeah, uh, certainly what's coming up in the chat box and from your presentation is, you know, understanding your patient in front of you as well as looking at what are all the options and opportunities available and I'm liking what you were saying about having a system that's agile yeah. Yeah, to be able to respond to it. Okay, so so we're a, a couple of minutes over. Um, Jeannie and Ian, I'm just going to give you about 30 seconds to think what's your parting shot to the audience? What's the one thing they can do the minute they put the phone down? You know, there's ambitious things for the longer term future. There's uh, innovative things they can take forward. But what's the quick win that they can do as soon as they put the phone down to, to get going, really? Um, and while you have a think about that, I will just thank um, all of our audience for joining today and participating so actively in the chat box. I think that's um, it's been fabulous to watch, um, and also on Twitter as well. So there's lots of mediums all going on at the same time. Um, the slides, as, as uh, Sandra said at the beginning, the slides and the recording will be available um, after the session. Um, and please do keep in touch with us to let us know what you take from today's session and move forward in your own health economy or what your ambition is to take forward, and, and if you need any help with that, really. So I just want to pass back to Jeannie and Ian to give them the last words on today's WebEx. So back to you both to give us your last thoughts. What I think is really important is if you can get some uh, areas where you've got um, patient or clinical problem requirement or opportunity, there is an approach to do it in terms of move this forward. But start from that sort of need rather than from the, uh, but there is systems and approaches and flexibility to do it. But start from the need. Don't start from the uh, from the widget or the or the phone. And I think for me is don't reinvent the wheel. So you know if if there's something that we've got that we can share um, or the learning that we've had, then certainly um, you know use use what's available. We can learn a lot from people out there as well. I mean the platform tech it's not close to us. It's an open platform. It allows that linkage for anyone. That's, that's the important bit. We can learn from other parts of the of the, of the health economy nationally. Brilliant. Thank you both. That's wonderful. I'm sure we'll be coming back to you to a part two to this discussion. There's more, more there. Um, so thank you very much. And at that point, I'll, I'll call this WebEx to a close and wish everybody a good afternoon. And uh, let's start making this different from today. So thank you very much indeed.